Thanks, Rosie. And good evening. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. It's 1795, and in a small... Oh, I'll start again. <laughs> It's 1795, and in a small wobbly boat off the coast of a distant rocky shore is a remarkable woman on an even more remarkable mission. Who is she, and what's she doing? Her name is Mary Wollstonecraft, and a couple of centuries later, she became my inspiration. Now, everybody's heard something about Wollstonecraft. Something to do with feminism? Well, yes, she invented it. She was the foremother of feminism with her text, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, in 1792, in which she argued for women's political representation a good century before the suffragettes, and which she also argued, apparently preposterously, that women were capable of reason. All they needed <laughs> was education. The official response was, what? And she earned a lot of enemies for this. Anyway, that's what most people knew, knew, know about her. That's pretty much all I knew about her. Until a particular encounter, which, which showed me that there's very, very, very much more to her than this. And uh, I fell quite badly in love. And I can still pinpoint the precise moment when this happened. I was an undergrad studying the romantic movement in English literature. And um, it turns out that she's written, as well as the famous vindication, she's written this book. This is my original copy. Um, she wrote, she did a travel book. It was in its day a bestseller. It was a huge hit, and the romantics loved it. She was off on this crazy caper around Scandinavia, sounding off left and right, giving it loads. It's in first-person narrative. It's very sad. It's very funny. It's a brilliant read. Um, Robert Southey gets very breathless about it. Samuel Taylor Coleridge channels it almost verbatim into his Kubla Khan. So naturally, I thought, oh, I'll check it out. You know, this is great. But there, in the introduction... Um, by the mighty romantics biographer Richard Holmes. There in the introduction was the clincher, and it was just one line. And it's something that you don't, she doesn't tell you in the text, it's the backstory. Mary Wollstonecraft was, in fact, on a treasure hunt. A treasure hunt. That just got me. I had to know more. And the backstory is even more juicy. It's just brilliant. So up until this point, Mary Wollstonecraft had been living in Paris. All of the hot-headed, young, beautiful radicals went to Paris. It, the, the revolution's in full throttle. Um, people, people were rushing over there. Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive. Although, incidentally, Wordsworth left as it became frightening for foreigners under the reign of terror. terror in the same week that Wollstonecraft arrived, because oh, fear wasn't a problem for Wollstonecraft, no. So she rocks up, she's in Paris, she's soaking up the revolution, she's hanging around with all these radical luminaries, she learns some French, and she also falls in love with, uh, with a tall, dashing American by the name of Gilbert Imlay. And it's a little bit unfortunate, Gilbert Imlay is a total dodgy geezer. He is smuggling... He was a little bit more handsome than Del Boy. He's smuggling silverware taken from head-chopped aristocrats. They lose their heads. He scoops up the silver. He's American, so he has license to do so. And he's shipping it out north to neutral Scandinavia. France is, of course, Revolution France is, of course, at war with all the crowned heads of Europe. So he's on this nice little earner, but one of his boats goes missing. A shipment with a cargo of aristocratic silver goes missing off the coast of Norway. You know where this is going. So he, in his brilliance, well, in the meantime, things have gone bad with Wollstonecraft. They've hit the rocks. They've had a baby out of wedlock. Um, but, you know, she's a little bit demanding, and he gets bored and shacks it with an actress, and it's all going wrong. And he thinks, I know what to do. And he says, to, you know, you're famous. You've written the vindication. You're quite loud and shouty. Go and find my silver. And in a masterstroke, he says, take the baby with you. And she does it. She had baby under one arm, and off she goes on this demented adventure on a treasure hunt. And that's the backstory to this extraordinary book. And it's a book to which I've returned so many times across the years, always with an increasing sense of fascination. And obviously, as one's own life, life landscape changes, you change as a reader. And, you know, I've got four kids now, and increasingly, I would return to the book, just, and there was only one question in my mind. And it was, how the bloody hell did she do it? And there was only one way to find out. So off we set. And I took my smallest kid, William, 10 months old, who was masquerading as Wollstonecraft's baby, Francis, who was also 10 months old. 
And the idea was, I mean, I didn't want to write a book about Wollstonecraft. The idea was to, to do a Wollstonecraft. I wanted to, to sort of, it was a biographical experiment, if you like. I wanted to try and channel some of her extraordinary energy, her indignation, her, 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 her optimism. And I just, well, the briefest of glances at any of her texts will tell you that this is never going to be easy because indefatigable doesn't cover it. The woman's bloody relentless, okay? So this was, it wasn't going to be easy, but nonetheless, off we set, and we retrace this ill-fated, heartbroken voyage in search of the missing silver, and we were inspired, we were inspired to continue on. So we went um, from there, we, we went to Paris. Paris was actually a bit of a disaster, but nonetheless, it was very instructive in how revolutions can go wrong and revolutionaries can go wrong. And from there, we traveled to America. And Wollstonecraft never made it to America, but it was her heart's desire. She was quoted by the then president of the United States. She also considered the Americans to be, you know, the pinnacle of civilization. She saw the American Revolution as one that had succeeded, that had not ended, mired in blood and tyranny and terror. So uh, I want. We traveled, and I explored her legacy, and I wanted to do her justice, but it wasn't easy, because Wollstonecraft is it's a roller coaster. You know, she's, she has depression. She attempted suicide twice, and I'm basically a really shallow and happy individual. And, you know, there were frequent points at which I just couldn't get traction on the experiences that she goes through. It was really hard. I, it, it, I really struggled with some of the things that she did and that she experienced. But what came out of this very, very, very strongly for me was a remarkable quality of hers, which actually is through all of her writings and also everything that she did. And it's an extraordinary kind of optimism and love for humanity. In her words, she calls it her ardent affection for the human race, her ardent affection for the human race. And it's odd because the human race never really loved her back. Um, I don't really have time to elaborate, but just trust me on this. Her life began in misery, and from there it went downhill. It was just awful. She went from hard knocks to even harder knocks, and then she died. So she had very little to be grateful for, um, but still managed to preserve this extraordinary sense of optimism. And I, I find that really inspirational. And uh, I'm going to read a very brief and short bit. This is her travel book. I'm going to read a, a, a couple of lines, but what she's doing here is, this is letter 11, so she's, 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 she's in hot pursuit of the captain that's, that's run off, the Norwegian captain that's run off with the silver. She's chasing him down the coast of Norway. There's huge rocks bursting through the sea around her. She's on a tiny boat, and she writes, The view of this wild coast as we sailed along it afforded me a continual subject for meditation. I anticipated the future improvement of the world. She's always doing that. The future improvement of the world and observed how much man still had to do. Imagination went still farther and pictured the state of man when earth could no longer support him. Where was he to fly from universal famine? Do not smile. I really became distressed for these fellow creatures yet unborn. Now, this is classic Wollstonecraft. She's self-conscious enough to realize that it's a little bit sentimental to get distressed about fellow creatures yet unborn. But it's sort of, it's, it's, it's very much the humanitarian spirit that underpins her, all of her writing in everything she did. And it's also worth noting that she elaborates this notion of catastrophic overpopulation and famine several years before Thomas Malthus's very famous work on the same subject. So another example of her being a pioneer of these huge ideas that are now entirely commonplace. Indeed, there's another example of that where she, um, she's famous for her vindication of right, the rights of woman, but she wrote a vindication of the rights of man before that. And that's what they used to, I mean, that was what, human rights were before they were human rights. So she and many other writers responded to Edmund Burke, the, the, the founding father of conservatism, whose huge attack on the French Revolution sparked this, this kind of human rights resurgence. And she got her vindication of the rights of man in before Thomas Paine's rights of man. So once again, a great pioneer. I'm going to go proceed now to the final chapter, and it's horrible. I really hate this bit. De death and tragedy are always at the heart of the Wollstonecraft story. Um, I wish it wasn't true, but it is. It took ages. I mean, it, you know, I avoided reading about it, let alone having to sort of look deep into it and, and write about it. Basically, Wollstonecraft dies twice. One death just isn't enough for Mary Wollstonecraft. No, she dies twice. The first death is in childbirth. She's only 38 years old. She dies giving birth to Mary Shelley, the future author of Frankenstein. And, yeah. And... Um, 
she, yeah, another, another gift from Wollstonecraft. She, um, she, you know, the, the woman who, who'd done more than all of her predecessors to fight for women and children and motherhood is destroyed by motherhood. It gets worse. It takes her 10 days to die. She has retained placenta and infections introduced. And she's fighting to live for the first time in her wretched life. She really has quite a lot to live for at the moment. She's got two daughters. She's got a stack of unfinished work. She's really getting respect through her writings. That She's got projects, all kinds of ideas. And she's finally got a decent bloke after all these real ne'er-do-wells. So it's, it's, she's got so much to live for. And she's, she's 38. She's at the height of her writing powers. And she's cruelly cut down. And it's the aforementioned good bloke, William Godwin, the anarchist philosopher, who in a state of... I mean, he really loves her. He, he writes about her unvanquishable greatness of soul. He really gets her. And he's devastated when she dies. He's with her in the 10 days that it takes for her to die. Writes about it. And then in a state of grief, he writes the first biography of Mary Wollstonecraft. And by today's standards, it's, you know, it's nothing particularly exceptional, but he references her two suicide attempts, her, the fact that she had a child out of wedlock, and the fact that you know, she fell in love quite a lot. And it just unleashes a hurricane. All of her enemies and detractors just came galloping to the feast. It was proof at last that she was a bitch and a slut and a whore. They start writing poems about her, calling her all the names. It's an absolutely vile spectacle. And her friends and supporters just, they just step back. They're just, they're silenced. And this is her second death, cruelly caused by the person who loved her most. And the injustice of this, I mean, I believe still to this day that this is why Mary Wollstonecraft has never had her dues, despite her vast contribution, despite the fact that her legacy is super fresh today. The quote, for example, um, I, I, uh, it is justice, not charity, that is wanting in this world. Hello, George Osborne. It is justice, not charity, that is wanting in this world. She, she deserves a really... A, a, an absolute renaissance in her reputation. Um, and that was one of the great spurs for me for finishing this book. I'm getting a little bit ranty, so I'm going to end now with a syrupy note of gratitude, which is that, personally for me, Wollstonecraft sent me on the best adventure of my life, and I managed to do it with a baby. And I guess I'd reached a point in life where I figured that extraordinary, ridiculous foreign capers and a certain kind of creativity ended with motherhood. But I was wrong. And Wollstonecraft, with her amazing courage, inspired me by example. And so, my, you know, doing a Wollstonecraft was the most empowering thing I've ever done. And I would like to end with her most quotable quote. I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you.